Welcome to FACT's webinar called The Grazer's Toolbox, Strategies for Pasture Improvements. This is the third and final installment in a three-part series featuring presenter Sarah Flack and hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating today's session. So before we dive in right into the presentation, just a few very quick introductions. Uh, for those of you that are new to us, Food Animal Concerns Trust Our Fact, we are a national nonprofit organization that's headquartered in Illinois. And we promote the safe and humane production of meat, milk, and eggs. I direct FACT's Humane Farming Program, which provides a uh, variety of opportunities for livestock and poultry farmers like you. Um, this webinar is part of our Humane Farming webinar series. So please visit our website to learn more about our other farmer services, including upcoming webinars. And we also have an ongoing scholarship program that folks might be interested in. So at this time, I'm very pleased to introduce our esteemed presenter, Sarah Flack. Sarah is the author of several books, including The Art and Science of Grazing and Organic Dairy Production, and is a nationally known speaker and consultant on grazing and organic livestock. She grew up on a Vermont family farm that used management intensive grazing and mob stocking uh, and later studied pasture management at the University of Vermont. Sarah's approach as a consultant, writer and speaker is to take a practical approach to applying the science of grazing. So we're really lucky to have her with us today and having have, it, have, have had her, her with us over the last few weeks uh, to share her experience and her expertise on grazing management best practices. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to Sarah so that she may begin her presentation. So Sarah, please take it away. Great, thanks. And um, just double check and tell me that I've got the sound working okay. Sounds um, good to me. Yep. Okay, <laughs> so... Great, and uh, so feel free to type your questions into the chat box in the sidebar as we go. I'm gonna, um, I may be answering your questions just as I go along, but a lot of times I'll try to save most of them for the end. And uh, I just wanna remind folks that this is part three of a three-part series that I've done. And part one back in February was on grazing management from the plants perspective, where we really talked a lot about plant physiology and a little bit on soils relating to grazing management. And then part two on the 18th of February, we looked at things from the livestock perspective, looking at how to maximize dry matter intake and meet all of the animals' nutritional and animal welfare needs out on pasture. And so this is part three. And so it seems like most of you did manage to attend both, which is great, because I'm really gonna dive in and build on what we talked on uh, about on those two first webinars. And so for those of you who either uh, missed one of those or maybe just get lost a little bit in some of the details today, you can also go back at any point and watch those ones again. So the majority of what I'm gonna be talking about today is gonna be uh, ruminant grazing related. So it's gonna be cows, goats, sheep. And from those of you who are typing in the type of livestock you were grazing in the sidebar, it sounds like we've got dairy cows, we've got beef cows, we've got um, dairy goats and sheep, I think I saw. And um, so a really nice diversity. And uh, so I'll be talking about all those different types of ruminants and really how to use those animals themselves to be the primary improver, our main tool for improving the pastures. Um, and so, and Larissa has the links to the previous webinars on the FACT website, and I also have them posted on my website. So what we're gonna be talking about is how can we create higher plant diversity, better plant digestibility, so there's better nutrition. How can we improve the overall quality of our pastures, increase the productivity, make it more palatable? And then how can we have that pasture grazing season be longer so that we can save money by not having to feed the animals in winter housing for as long by making that really long grazing season? And we've got to, in this process, make sure that we're meeting the needs of the livestock. And here you can see a really well-fed, 100% um, grass-fed dairy cow uh, out on pasture. And then how can we also be meeting the needs of the plants and the soils in this process? 
So this is what I call the grazer's toolbox. These are a lot of the things, really most of the things that I use when I'm working with a farmer to try to figure out what's going on in the pastures and how can we improve them. So observation skills is number one, and that includes observing and also monitoring and probably record keeping of your pastures. We're also going to be changing the length of your regrowth and recovery periods to allow those plants to either get more mature or maybe sometimes graze them when they're a little bit shorter or less mature intentionally to try to change the way things are growing in the pasture or what's growing in the pasture. Post-grazing residual, that's how much you're leaving behind in the pasture that's still attached to the plant. By leaving more or less behind, you're having an effect on the pasture. And then the pre-grazing height, how tall do you let it go before you graze it? The stocking rate and stocking density, and we'll define and talk about those two in a little while. The trampling effect, that hoof impact. Fallowing means letting the pastures actually grow for a while and not mowing or grazing them. That's an interesting technique that farmers can use if they've got enough land to let some lie fallow for a year or part of a year. Then there's clipping before or after grazing. And then we get into the more expensive things. These are usually things I do later because they cost more money and I want to try to figure out what are all the things I can do with just the animal impact first before I spend money on tillage, aeration, seeding, and fertilizing and those things. And I've added humility to the list in the grazer's toolbox because I feel like the more humble we are as we go out and start monitoring our pastures and observing them, the more likely we are to be able to see things maybe not going in the right direction. We won't just be assuming that our grazing plan was really great and it's working. We'll instead go out there and say, okay, the weather is challenging. I might have underestimated or overestimated how much rainfall or heat or dry weather we were going to get, or maybe how much the cows and the sheep and the goats were going to eat. Um, so constantly just knowing that as soon as you come up with your grazing plan, just assume that you probably made some mistakes and, uh, and start observing and adjusting as needed. Larissa, there might be a couple people who can't see the slides. Yes, so there's a, a way that you can view them on your computer I just posted. So hopefully that works for those folks that are having some lag issues. Great. So um, I just had a lag getting to this next slide. <laughs> okay, so I just wanna quickly review this slide. This is one from our last webinar talking about observation and the importance of monitoring and observing. Just want to go back and say we're mostly going to be talking about plants and soils today, but it's also important to be observing the animals. And this is just the list of a lot of the key points I'm observing when I'm working with cows or sheep or goats out on pasture, looking at rumen fill, body condition scoring, rate of gain, reproductive performance, looking at manure scoring, milk urea nitrogen or blood urea nitrogen levels, milk production levels observing for any heat stress concerns and observing for behavior to make sure the animals are happily grazing out there and not exhibiting signs of stress. So we're going to be doing the same sort of observation with our pasture plants and our soils and the biological activity happening in and above the soils so that we can really start to see what is your farm telling you about how your grazing management is changing your pastures. What's getting better, what's not getting better, and what's really getting worse. And there's a lot of different ways to do this. This is just the very quick pasture monitoring worksheet that is one of the appendices in the back of my book. And I made something really, really short because I was trying to get farmers to actually use it. And a lot of the, the really, really good pasture monitoring worksheets out there are a longer process. I think they're excellent. Some of the ones um, Alan Savory developed through um, holistic management, you can get those. Um, there's also th some through NRCS, um, Natural Resources Conservation Service has some really good ones. And then if you're not gonna use a multi-page worksheet, then this really short one just walks you through scoring the plant diversity in your pasture, the plant density in your pasture, plant palatability, plant growth rate, and soil health, which are some of the key points to be monitoring to see what's getting better and what's getting worse. <laughs> 
So one of the most important things to be thinking about is that that really catching the problems early before they become really obvious is very important, especially as our climate gets more and more um, hotter or drier or wetter, depending on where you are and the time of year. And uh, this is just a slide to show you the difference between two farms that are really close to each other. They have the same soil type. They're about five miles apart. The lush green pasture in the top left, the yellow flowers are bird's foot trefoil. There's also vetch and red clover and white clover and at least seven or eight species of grass in there. That's a farm that has done a really good job of grazing management on very challenging soils with really variable recovery periods and short periods of occupation, leaving lots of plant residue behind for many years. The farm on the lower right is a farm with very similar soils or identical soils actually, very close by, so exactly the same climate too. And they were also using a variable recovery period, but not quite as long at certain times of the year. So their recovery period was seven to 30 days, whereas the top slide, their recovery period was more like 18 to 45 days. And both farms from the road looked fine until, in this case, there was a really dry period. And then the farm that had been doing these really, really variable recovery periods continued to grow well, whereas the other farm suddenly ended up getting a lot of bare soil and a lot of annual plants and really weedy grasses and forbs in the pasture. And this is something that probably could have been caught if that regular pasture monitoring was being done all of the time, because you would have noticed a gradual decrease in plant density and plants starting to be more annuals and less perennials, root systems not being quite as deep, so that you could have caught it before this really extreme, obvious system um, failure that you can see in the really dry weather. So just a quick review, if your pasture is improving, you're gonna see closer plant spacing, higher plant density. You're gonna see less bare soil, ideally no bare soil visible. You'll have faster plant growth and you'll have plants growing over a longer growing period. So your grazing season should get longer. You should have high biological activity so that the manure landing out in the pasture is decomposing and being incorporated into the soil quickly. You should see a higher plant diversity with more plant species out there and ideally more and more perennial plants over time. And you also wanna see really good soil structure and good soil fertility. And I always like to include these quotes um, from uh, many, many years ago. This one's from 1898. Robert Elliott wrote that the management of the pasture is even of more importance than the selection of the seed and the preparation of the land. And so it's just a reminder that our primary tool in improving our pastures is the grazing management with the livestock. So soils are incredibly important and sometimes you will also need to reseed your pasture to improve the pastures. But Overall, if you're not doing good grazing management already or setting up the infrastructure and management skills so that you can do good grazing management, if you spend a bunch of money and put a lot of work into improving the soil fertility, bringing in fertilizers and things like that, and if you start spending money on new and improved seeds before you have a good grazing management system, the whole grazing system is just gonna revert back to the previous weedy, less productive system that you had before. So it's always very important to make sure you've got this good grazing management system plan in place before you start spending the money on the soils and the seed. And this is just a reminder from webinar number one. These are the guidelines, the key points that underlie all of the good grazing management systems that are out there. They're gonna have recovery or regrowth periods, which are variable. So it's varied depending on how fast the plants are growing. So you're gonna be changing the plant height and the stage of maturity. Sometimes you'll wanna graze them when they're taller, sometimes shorter, but you, if you're trying to improve plant vigor, you've gotta make sure they are fully recovered before you graze them. And then also short periods of occupation. So you're not leaving them in the paddock for too long. 
And in this, this period of occupation is how you're going to be able to create different stocking densities that we'll talk about in detail in a minute, leave behind different amounts of residuals, and prevent the regrazing of recovering or regrowing plants. So I want to talk a little bit about what overgrazing damage is and how it happens so that you can start training your eyes to be able to, to spot it out in the pastures. So overgrazing damage happens when the livestock graze a plant while it is still growing actively from its carbohydrate energy reserves instead of from active photosynthesis. So it's a plant that's not yet fully recovered, hasn't had time to recharge its own energy reserves, and it's getting grazed off again. And this commonly happens when animals stay in the paddock for too long, when that period of occupation gets to be too long, or if the animals are returned to the paddock too soon before the plants are fully recovered. And the photo you can see here is a pasture which we've actually given a, over a 45-day recovery period to, to try to get those plants to regrow. But this pasture has had so many years of overgrazing damage that the only plants that are really growing very tall in here are actually the buttercups and the grasses that have been protected by growing in the buttercups and the actively grazed areas in the pasture now just have these permanently stunted plants that won't grow any taller. So this is a quote from André Voisin's book that he wrote in the 1950s called Grass Productivity. And he describes what happens when paddocks are not rested long enough between each grazing. And this is called, he calls it untoward acceleration. And it creates a situation where each grazing of the paddock provides less and less forage. And then the regrowth period gets shorter throughout the grazing season because you end up having to move the cows or sheep faster because you're running out of grass in that paddock until most of the plants are overgrazed in those pastures and there's little or no feed left in the paddocks. So you start rotating and then you end up rotating faster because you just don't have enough feed in those pastures, which is the opposite of what you need to be doing. Andre Voisin called it untoward acceleration. I've seen Greg Judy speak on this, and I think he just calls it the death spiral um, for your pastures, which is a very good description of what's happening. So let's talk a little more about overgrazing and when it might most commonly happen on a farm. In the fall, at least around here in the northern part of the U.S., I see folks who will take down their interior paddock subdividing fences in the fall when the growth seems to have slowed down and maybe almost stopped and just let the animals go everywhere to clean up the pastures so it looks tidy going into the winter. You can actually do quite a lot of damage by grazing those plants down too short in the fall or people who go out in the fall and try to mow things short to have it look tidy. That can do overgrazing damage to those plants. Anytime you're leaving animals in a pasture for too many days in a row, you're probably doing some overgrazing damage if plants are growing fast enough that they can get nibbled off again by the livestock while they're in that same paddock. If you have a fixed grazing rotation where maybe you have five or six paddocks and you leave them in each paddock for a couple of days and then move them to the next one, so you're not able to vary that regrowth and recovery period. And then you can also do overgrazing damage with your mower. If you are clipping your paddocks to tidy them up after grazing, but you don't get in there with the mower until things have started to regrow a little bit. And we'll talk about that in some more detail in a little while. So this is what overgrazing damage can look like. On the left there, that's my hand being used to measure the um, plant height. That's, that's a close-up of that pasture we looked at before. This pasture has been growing for over 45 days. It ideally, based on the soil tests, should be you know, 10 to 12 inches tall of lush vegetative growth. But you can see the plants have been so stunted and damaged for many years of overgrazing damage that the plants that have survived have been the ones that just don't grow tall. So it's been naturally selected for short plants. And so we're going to have to do some pretty major repair to get this pasture to regrow because clearly just letting it grow longer and giving it longer rests isn't going to be enough. And then there's the pasture on the right again, and that's another one where the damage is now so severe we've lost most of the really highly productive, deep-rooted perennial grasses and legumes, and so that's an area we may really have to go in and do some reseeding also.
But this is also overgrazing damage. Overgrazing damage can be done with a lot of animals in a smallish paddock, and it can also be done with a small number of animals in a really big paddock. So this is just a handful of dairy heifers in a very large pasture, and they just get the whole pasture every summer, all summer. And from the road, it looks like there's lots of stuff out there for them to eat. But if you walk out into this pasture, you'll find there's some areas that are very short that they keep going back and grazing every couple of days. They're preferred plants. And then there's many, many areas where things have either grown up into weeds or include overmature grasses that are not very palatable. So you have this combination of short overgrazed plants. And then you also have these tall weedy plants that are starting to take over and dominate the pasture. So those are just a few examples of overgrazing damage, which is really the plants being grazed before they are fully recovered. But then the other thing we need to be looking out for, which can happen if we leave the animals in the paddock for too long, is grazing the plants down too short. And that's when they're going to be consuming the energy storage areas in the plant. So the way to control all of this is adding more paddocks or grazing cells or using that front fence and the back fence, moving them both more often so that you've got better control over that period of occupation, better control over the length of that regrowth or recovery period. And then we can really start to increase or in some cases decrease the stocking density so that we can get more or less trampling effect and more or less residual, that post-grazing residual left behind. So before we dive into stocking densities and stocking rates and a bunch of these other things, I wanted to talk a little bit about soils because I don't want to downplay how important it is to make sure that your soil fertility is balanced and meets the needs of the pasture plants that you are either already have there or you're gonna plant. And that also, as you can see in this slide, that you're really observing the soil structure and tilth and um, making sure that you don't have soil compaction. I'm finding that soil compaction is an increasing problem, especially in areas like here in the northern part of the US and the northeast, where we're getting these more and more of these high rainfall events. So we'll have these times of the year when the soil is fully saturated. And we'll also having more time in the winter where the soils are not frozen, they're thawed and muddy. And if you've got livestock out there, whether it's winter or summer, and the soils are really muddy and wet and fully saturated, you can get soil compaction, particularly in our heavier soils. So this is a photo of the soil penetrometer that I carry around with me during uh, farm visits to try to get a sense of whether soil compaction is one of the limiting factors on the farm before we start spending money on seeds or bringing in fertilizer and stuff, really trying to do a thorough assessment. So we're digging a hole, we're looking at the soil structure, we're using a soil penetrometer to look at the compaction. And if there's compaction, we're gonna have a conversation about when is that compaction happening? Did it happen a couple of years previously and it's just an, a lingering effect? Or is it a pasture that livestock have access to in the winter, perhaps inappropriately? We went, may want to keep them out of some of these pastures um, during that wet, thawed soil conditions in the winter. I see a lot of damage happening to pastures in the winter from people who are feeding out hay on the pasture. In areas where historically that's been a great practice of feeding out hay on the pasture in the winter, bringing out the animals, having them spread their own manure, spread that hay around on the pasture, get some fresh air. But in the previous years, if that soil has been covered with a thick layer of snow or has been frozen, that means that you can do it without damaging the soil. But if your climate has changed and that soil is thawed and muddy, you might be starting to damage those soils during the winter by feeding out hay out there. Some folks refer to that as bale grazing. So it's one of those grazing tools that you can use, which can be really great or really damaging depending on how and when you apply it. I also am a big fan of soil testing. And um, my main recommendation with soil testing is pick a lab and use that lab consistently. 
don't try to compare um, soil tests from one different lab to a different lab. Um, they use different extraction techniques. And so it's important to pick a good local lab near you, use that lab and test regularly, especially in the early years of trying to get new plants established in your pasture. If you have soils which are very wet for extended periods of time during the grazing season, during the growing season, you also just need to be aware that most of our grazing adapted perennial grasses and legumes are not well adapted to that sort of saturated soils where you've got standing water for long periods of time or fully saturated soils for an extended period of time. This photo is of a sedge, S-E-D-G-E, -E, and sedges are plants which are not grasses, even though they look an awful lot like a grass. These have triangular stems, and these are an indicator that you might have certain times of the year where the soil is so wet and fully saturated that you're starting to drown out the roots of your more productive grasses and legumes. And so it's just important to really scout your farm's land base and make sure you understand what areas are growing poorly because of underlying soil conditions and which ones are growing poorly because of maybe grazing management or winter management of those areas. Another thing to be looking at um, when you're observing your soils is biological activity. The bottom left photo here is of a, um, a fairly fresh, kind of recently dried out um, cow pie. And all of those little oval holes in it are made by the local dung beetle that lives in the northern of the US and Canada. And there's a close up photo of it there on the top right. They like to fly in and land on the fresh cow pies. And these are going to be all different species of dung beetles, depending on where you are in the world. Um, there's much more interesting species, actually, as you go further south and more diversity of them and um, somewhat lower um, diversity of species up here. So this is just an example of one of the primary cow pie or um, they really do like the cow manure better than the, the goat and the sheep manure, unfortunately. Um, but this is one of the primary species that will come in and start the process of moving the manure down into the soil. And then you're also going to have all different types of fly species, earthworms, and other beetles that will work on this. And then, of course, we've got the soil bacteria and fungi also. So one of the things you can really do is observe how long does it take for one of the um, you know, cow pie or the goat manure or sheep manure landing in that pasture, how long does it take to break down and get incorporated into the soil? So now we're going to talk about stocking density, stocking rates, trampling, and manure distribution. This is a photo showing a nice example of a um, medium to high stocking density. And you can see that there's a nice post-grazing residual. It is trampled, but not too trampled. It's not muddy there. And there's a really nice distribution of manure from that type of stocking density. So I just want to make sure we're clear on the difference between stocking density and stocking rate. Stocking rate is about the total number of animals on the whole farm. So sometimes people will tell you their stocking rate as the total number of animals on their entire farm. And sometimes it'll just be the total number of animals on just their grazing lands. So you need to make sure you ask exactly what they're saying. Stocking density is much more specifically related to the total number of animals, or more frequently ex it's expressed as the total number of pounds of animal per acre in that specific individual paddock at a specific time. So the stocking density is what you'll often read about as, you know, ultra high stocking or high stocking or mob stocking or lower or medium stocking densities too. So here is a flock of dairy sheep with a nice stocking density for a, a paddock that's being grazed for half a day. These sheep are getting milked and then uh, twice a day. And so they're getting a fresh paddock twice a day. So you can see that's a, that's a nice density for the sheep to be able to meet their nutritional needs, not feel too crowded, and leave behind a nice post-grazing residual. Talking a little bit about what happens as we change the stocking density. So obviously our stocking density gets higher as we move the animals more frequently into smaller paddocks. And so this is a, um, let's see, I think this is a, 
This is a six day paddock being grazed with dairy cattle. And the darker spots are feces, the browner spots are, and then the purple and the green spots are urine. And you can see in the top right, you've got the water tank and the gate. And so the animals are going in here and grazing for six days in a row, going back and forth to the barn to get milked a couple of times a day. And they clearly spend a lot more time near the gate and the water tank. And that's where the majority of the manure is getting dropped. So you actually, in this six-day paddock, with this very low stocking density, you've got nutrient transport going on where they're grazing a lot on the far left of the paddock. And then they're walking over and pooping near the gate and the water tank. So they're dropping the manure, probably accumulating it to levels which is too high near the gate and the water tank. And now we've got soil nutrient deficiencies on the other side of the pasture. So over time, you'll end up with these short, less vigorous plants growing in the far left. And then over by the gate, you might be really overwhelmed with tall, rank orchard grass that has too much nitrogen and potassium in it that the animals don't really want to eat. And so the quick fix solution to that is to divide this paddock in half and make it into two three-day paddocks. That would be a significant improvement. Or better yet, try to figure out how to strip graze this so that you can give them a fresh paddock once a day or maybe even twice a day after each milking since it's a dairy herd. So higher stocking densities are going to give you a more effective trampling impact, a more thorough defoliation of the plants, and more efficient forage uh, utilization and intake generally. So you can see here in the top left, you can see the beef herd has just been moved into a new strip of pasture. They've just come out of this area and all of these little bare stumps and stalks that you can see, those were fully mature burdock plants. And they've eaten all of the burdock leaves and tops and um, flowers off and just let the stems and this is a beef herd that's being moved to a fresh pasture several times a day at a fairly high stocking density. So this works great for a dairy, uh, for a beef herd, but you may not want to do this with a dairy herd because you would be forcing those higher nutrient need dairy cows to eat more of this low digestibility fiber that you find in the, in the burdock plants or in the overmature cool season grasses that were in this paddock. So you might not be able to maintain good milk production or meet the nutritional needs of a really high performance dairy cow with this very high stock density forcing them to eat this. But this works really well with this beef herd. And so we've got to be really flexible with our stocking densities and not dogmatic about what stock density to use. You're going to change it up depending on the impact you want on the pasture and the type of animals that you're grazing. So just doing some quick math, this is an example of changing from a three-day period of occupation to a one-day period of, or a, or a twice-a-day period of occupation, moving them twice a day, with 50 Jersey cows, putting them in a four-acre paddock every three days to start with. That's 12,500 pounds of animals per acre, so that's a medium to low stocking density. If you change the system so that you're moving them once a day instead of every three days, then that's going to be one and a quarter acres. And now your new stocking density is 40,000 pounds per acre. And moving them just once a day at 40,000 pounds is going to have a significant um, impact on the grazing management and you'll have some trampling effect and pastures will improve over time. If you want to go to an even higher stocking density and move them twice a day, those paddocks are now going to be 0.63 acres per half day. And so now we're at 80,000 pounds of animals per acre. So just an example of how making those paddocks smaller, moving them more often can increase the stocking density and get more of that trampling effect. You'll get more utilization of even the weedy plants in that situation. The trick is how many times a day do you really have time to move your livestock? If you're there full time on the farm and you've got tons of kids who love to go out and move the front fence forward frequently, it'll work great. You might be able to use one of the computerized bat latches to open that gate in front of the animals automatically a couple of times a day. You might be able to use 
tumble wheels to move the front fence forward with less labor where you don't have to move individual fence posts as often. This is a farm in Missouri grazing a uh, pasture that they were trying to improve. And this is a beef farm on an operation which also has vegetables and greenhouses and other things. So there's always people there and nearby. And it's relatively easy for somebody to walk down and move that front, front fence forward many times a day and then move the back fence up every day or two and the water tub and minerals behind them. So they're able to use this beef herd to improve these pastures by really getting them to trample and graze things. This is a mixture of Johnson grass, tall fescue, a lot of different weed species, but over time we're starting to see more and more of the palatable legumes and cool season perennial grasses coming in to replace some of those less desirable species. The balancing act is that we want to make sure that the animal's needs are being met when we're moving to these higher stocking densities. And one of the things that's frequently done as we try to move towards these higher stocking densities to graze at is letting more pasture accumulate, letting those pastures grow taller and likely become more mature before you put the animals in there to graze it. But then it becomes really important to make sure you're meeting the nutritional needs by understanding the digestibility of the grasses and the legumes that are out there in the pasture. Because one of the ways to be able to graze at a really high stocking density is let those plants get really, really tall and mature, then go in there, have them graze it and trample it. But if those grasses in particular are really mature, as we talked about in the last webinar, the digestibility is going to be much lower. It's going to be really hard for those animals to meet their nutritional needs if they're lactating or growing fast. And so that's why in some cases, some farms have gone to these very high stocking densities, but have had to back off a bit, at least with some of their higher nutrient need uh, animal groups. I want to do one more uh, example stocking density calculation before we move on to some of the other topics. This is another dairy example. This is 82 Holsteins. They're getting two acres of pasture each day plus supplemental feed in the barn. And the cows average 1,250 pounds each and there's 82 of them. So if anybody's feeling math inclined, you can start doing the math to figure out how many pounds of Holstein cows is that um, per, per acre going into that pasture. So what's the stocking density if they get one paddock per day, a total of two acres? And then what's going to be that stocking density if they're getting a fresh paddock after each milking? So getting two paddocks a day. And see some of you typing the math in there. You're getting it right. Um, so the 82 cows times 1,250 is 102,500 pounds of animals divided by two acres. So 51,250. That's the stocking density for that pasture if they're getting one paddock a day, two, two acres a day. And then if you divide it up, so they're getting a fresh paddock after each milking, then that stocking density is 102,500. And this is really in the range of a very reasonable stocking density for a dairy herd. It's in this kind of 60 to maybe just over 100,000 pounds of animals um, per, per acre. Sometimes you might have a much higher stocking density than that. And those of you running beef animals and really focusing on um, some of the uh, improvements from a higher stocking density might go quite a bit higher than that. But again, it's important not to be dogmatic about that stock density and that trampling effect. Sometimes you want it and sometimes you don't. So this is an example of a pasture that would really benefit from some trampling. This is a moss on the soil surface and a very shallow root system. So this is an area where getting the animals to come and really punch that soil up a bit, um, maybe combining that with adding some seed might be a way to really start to improve this pasture. But we don't want to do it when the soils are super wet and saturated because then we might get compaction. Here's an example of some really beneficial trampling. That bottom left, you can see where the pastures were heavily trampled, but um, and some feed actually got fed out there at the same time. The soils were not compacted. And then this is 
a part of the annual crop rotation on this farm. On that top left, they have plowed up that same area that was trampled earlier in the year. And they have planted, in this case, uh, sorghum sedan grass. And then they have uh, grazed that off once and that sorghum sedan grass is starting to regrow so that it can be grazed again. So this is an example of a beneficial trampling as part of a crop rotation in a pasture renovation um, rotation. This photo shows two examples of trampling when it was done when uh, the soils were really not in a good condition to be heavily trampled. On the left there, the pasture has been trampled there's a lot of soil compaction, created a lot of bare soil, and in this case, Canada thistle was able to, the seeds blew in and germinated in the bare soil between the plants after the plants had been damaged by trampling when the soils were really wet. And now there's this really difficult to control stand of Canada thistle in this area, which is a perennial thistle. On the right, you can see there's some trampling that happened in this heavy clay soil, and the the animals were sinking into the mud so deeply that they were starting to damage the crowns of the plants and even the roots in some places. And so that's gonna be an area where weeds are gonna get hard to manage. Here's an example on the left-hand side of a really nice trampling and post-grazing residual. You can see where I, I kind of crouched down in the pasture here and on the right is uh, grasses that were on the other side of the fence that were not grazed or trampled. And on the left, that's a nice trampled post-grazing residual in a somewhat mature uh, orchard grass dominant cool season perennial pasture. There's a question about using um, hogs or pigs for tillage instead of trampling. And you can use that. My advice with um, pigs is that if you leave them in an area for too long, they can overwork the soils and start to break down the soil structure. So you just need to be really cautious with using um, pigs for tillage, but it can work very well if it's done correctly. So this is a slide showing you the difference in the next grazing rotation after half this pasture was grazed with a higher stocking density and half with a lower stocking density. So on the right, you can see there's quite a bit of, uh, in this case, tall fescue seed head left over that didn't get trampled the last time. That was grazed with a lower stocking density where the animals were given a bigger area and then maybe moved out more quickly. Whereas on the left, they were concentrated into a smaller paddock. So you had more thorough trampling and you don't have any of those tall fescue seed heads left over. But you can also see that the there's plenty of cows happily grazing. This is a, a beef herd. They're happily grazing on the right-hand side there. They're just picking around between those seed heads. So this is a farm where he chose not to do a post-grazing clipping to deal with those seed heads. And the cows are doing just fine in that. Here's a dairy sheep farm, and you can see this is the post-grazing residual left over. And so this is where we can start thinking about, you know, when is it appropriate to do a post-grazing clipping? And when is it better to just leave it? So again, much like the previous slide, this farmer is also not going to do a post-grazing clipping in this area. There are still some standing bunches of the bunch grass seed heads left over, but most of the pasture has been trampled enough or grazed enough that it's going to grow back just fine and these dairy sheep will be able to pick and choose between these plants and graze through the next time. This is a farm in Ontario during a drought that had the beef herd go through and graze and trample an area and left behind lots and lots of, in this case, orchard grass bunches of overmature seed heads that were not grazed or trampled, chose not to clip. And then this is the really nice vegetative regrowth that's come up um, between these now mature seed heads. And so again, this is a farm choosing not to clip. In this case, they're really having a big advantage by not clipping here because this happened to be a very dry summer. So they've left behind this nice trampled post-grazing residual and residue on the soil surface, protecting the soil from drying out and getting too hot in the drought. And then also all of these tall dried out bunches of seed heads are slowing the wind speed as it goes across this pasture and protecting the soil from drying out. 
So much like the stocking density, each farm will really have to determine when it makes sense to uh, clip after you graze to clean up the pastures and when not to. And the one time where you might really want to think about a post-grazing clipping is if you've got high performance animals and you have a problematic weed species and you can time that post-grazing clipping so that you're not damaging recovering pasture plants by mowing them while they're starting to regrow, but you're able to cut off that problem weed before it produces a seed crop. In some cases, a post-grazing clipping can also be good if you have high-performance animals and you really need to have that pasture be very easy for animals to go in and maximize dry matter intake. That DMI stands for dry matter intake. So sometimes it's a good tool. Um, sometimes it's not worth it. And the timing of when you do that that clipping is very important. It's really important if you decide to clip for a weed species or if you have too much untrampled residue, residual left behind, you wanna do that immediately after grazing. Don't wait until some of those plants have started to regrow or elongate their leaves or those clover plants are starting to lift the, the leaves up um, out of the understory. Because if you mow off that regrowing plant material, you're actually doing overgrazing damage. And if you mow it too short, you're also damaging the crown and the base of those plants. I also wanna say that different plants respond differently to being trampled or mowed too short. So alfalfa, for example, really does not like being consistently grazed with a very high stock density and being trampled because those crowns are up above the soil surface and they would rather be left behind with an untrampled post-grazing residual. There's some alfalfa mixed in with the forage chicory in that pasture photo on the left there. Forage chicory is another one. Um, it'll tolerate a little bit of trampling, but not a huge amount of it on a regular basis. On the right is a warm season perennial grass, in this case switchgrass, and that's one where there's gonna be certain times of the year when those tillers are elongating, where you really want to make sure that you're not grazing them too short and also not trampling them too short. So it's very important to know what plant species you have in your pastures and understand how each of them like to be grazed a little bit differently. So this is a photo of a pasture that has a mixture of bunch grasses. You can see the, in this case, it's mostly orchard grass is the bunch grasses in here. All those little tufts of green in the pasture are those bunch grasses. And then we've also got sod forming grasses in between in which this, this farm, it's mostly Kentucky bluegrass in between, but on other farms that might be um, brome grass is another uh, sod forming grass. They each like to be managed a little bit differently. Those sod forming grasses can often tolerate, um, certainly the Kentucky bluegrass can tolerate being grazed shorter more often, whereas the orchard grass doesn't like to be grazed short as often. So by choosing a taller post-grazing residual, you will make that pasture have more orchard grass in it and more of the grasses that prefer that post-grazing residual. If you decide to graze it shorter and leave behind a shorter post-grazing residual, you're gonna encourage more Kentucky bluegrass and those shorter growing sod forming grasses. Here's another bunch grass, in this case, uh, tall fescue. And then in between you can see there's a bunch of sod forming grasses and shorter bunch grasses. There's a third group of types of grasses, which are the elongating or the jointing grasses. In this photo here, this is reed canary grass. And what the elongating grasses or jointing grasses do is they tend to elongate the tillers. So they're elongating the, the internodes on the grass stems throughout the whole grazing season. And so grasses in this category that are cool season grasses are Timothy, some of the brome grasses, and then also this photo, the reed canary grass. So those are grasses that tend to grow taller year round. They produce more of the stemmy material. And in general, they don't tolerate being grazed as short as often. So if you want more of those grasses, again, you need to leave behind that taller post-grazing residual.
Many of the warm season perennial grasses are also need to be managed the same way. They elongate their tillers year round and need to have a taller post-grazing residual. You can get a little more detail on that, I think, in chapter six in my book, where I go into detail about the different grass species and their growth um, habits and grazing preferences. So just getting back to this idea of choosing different pre-grazing heights and then deciding how short you will let the animals graze things and how much trampling can do, you can completely change the plant species composition in your pastures by letting things grow taller or not letting it grow as tall and then grazing it either shorter or leaving a much taller post-grazing residual. This is a pasture that over time, they tried to do a much taller pre-grazing height, but the forage quality wasn't very good and they didn't have time to move the animals really frequently with a high stock density. So they weren't able to graze it down very short or get a very thorough trampling and they didn't do any clipping. And they actually over time ended up with lower plant density and the pasture really started to get dominated by these tall bunch grasses, in this case, a lot of orchard grass and some quack grass and they started to lose those higher density sod forming grasses and legumes. So the way to counteract this is to graze this pasture uh, shorter or graze it more frequently for a little while and try to move the plant species composition back towards more sod forming grasses. It's also important to know that your grasses grow very differently at different times of the year. And this applies to the, the warm season perennial grasses that you'll have as we travel further south in the U.S. And then the cool season perennial grasses that are more dominant up north here. And so if you graze things, um, for example, if you graze your cool season grasses too short in the fall, you're going to be damaging some of the new grass tillers that might increase the plant density the next spring. But if you graze things strategically short in a few areas on your farm in the spring, you might actually stimulate increased tiller formation and increase plant density over time in the pastures. So lots of different strategies with um, changing plant species composition and increasing plant density without ever having to spend money on the seed. If you do get to a point where you have a pasture where you really need to do some reseeding, number one is make sure you're choosing the right plant species. A lot of the pasture species mixes are very generic and they may not be suited to your specific climate. So you wanna really make sure that you're not bringing in seed that has plants in it that are actually gonna either just die because it's too cold or too wet or too hot, or in some cases, some of those seed mixes will bring in species that will have very low palatability and can really become kind of noxious in your pastures. So do the research first. And then um, here's some examples of low cost ways to introduce seeds to the pasture. This was a farm that had relatively low plant density, actually very low plant density in a couple of their pastures. And they were trying to figure out what to do. They didn't want to plow the whole thing up and reseed it. The weather forecast predicted a very high rainfall event. They had a beef herd out right near this low plant density pasture. They decided to try going out and spinning on the seed, just broadcasting it over the top of the pasture. And then they moved the animals very frequently through that low density pasture as it was raining and the soil was really wet, but they didn't leave them too long. So they didn't trample it um, to a point where they were compacting it. They just pushed the seed into this nice moist soil very effectively. And they got a fantastic germination. In this case, you can see there's several different species of legumes and grasses in that top left photo um, starting to germinate in that trample seeding area. The bottom right, the farmer liked the plant species that he already had in this kind of medium plant density pasture. And so what he did is he let the grasses and legumes in that pasture go to seed. Then once those seeds were fully developed on the uh, grass plants, then he did a somewhat high density grazing and trampled those seeds down into the soil. And you can see there's a lot of new improved grass species germinating in that one. <laughs> 
This is red clover seed germinating out, germinating out of a cow pie. The red clover and white clover seeds are some of the few seeds that can actually pass undigested through our ruminants and germinate in the manure. So in this case, um, the farmer had actually grazed them in a pasture that had a lot of red clover that had gone to seed and then turned them into another pasture that didn't have as much red clover in it and allowed that red clover to germinate in the cow pies. So those are our low cost reseeding strategies. And then of course, there's various types of tillage and mechanical seeding that can be done if you really just get to a point where that's what's necessary to fix the pasture. And I put this slide in so you can really see, you know, one of the challenges with doing that sort of a full reseeding is lower plant density to begin with and the increased risk of having a lot of weeds come in. So reseeding is something that we do sometimes do, but it's somewhat of a last resort. So the final slide here is just kind of tying everything together. Um, how do we maximize pasture dry matter intake for our livestock? We need a higher density of plants with the vegetative leaf area. And if we think back to the last webinar, we specifically need to have um, more grass tillers per square foot so that our animals can get more dry matter from grass in each bite. So to do that, we need shorter periods of occupation and long and variable recovery periods. And the way that we're improving the pastures is using these shorter periods of occupation, depending on what stocking density you wanna have and making sure that we have long enough regrowth periods to allow those plants to be fully recovered and recharge their own energy reserves. So this is the goal, the high plant density pasture with um, many species of legumes and grasses and forbs. Um, so that wraps up today. And um, Larissa, I ran a little late today, um, but do we have time for me to answer some of these questions? I, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. If you can stick around for, you know, five or 10 minutes, that would be wonderful. Um, yeah. And wanna... again, the, um, the link to this webinar will be posted so you can um, watch it again. Uh, the recording will be posted on the FACT website and also on mine. And I, I want to give a shout out to the um, the book that's on the screen too. I find that to be a, a fantastic resource. So if folks are able to invest in it. Um, it really kind of breaks down everything into a very palatable, um, understandable, practical um, um, examples and ways of going forward. So there's been some great comments and questions coming in. Um, one person says that they are feeding out hay on the pasture at certain times of the year. It doesn't specify when, but what they're doing is they're using round bales. And instead of just setting the round bale in the pasture, they're unrolling them. And then the hay is much um, more thinly spread out. So then they're combination of that and then also moving the cattle really frequently to new pastures. That's how they avoid over trampling or soil compaction or too much pugging of their pastures. Um, so there's lots of different ways if you do have times of the year when you want to be feeding out hay on your pastures to avoid damaging the soils while still getting that nutrient Im import um, benefit of feeding out hay and having the animals out on the pastures. <laughs> so um, somebody says that they really don't want to use fertilizer in the long term. So how do you recommend to start using fertilizer if you have very poor pasture? And then can you slowly phase out, phase out the fertilizer with proper management? Um, so my answer is it depends. <laughs> That's my favorite answer for many of these things. Um, I would say number one, you really need to test the soils because a lot of times people will look at your pasture and say, oh, it looks poor, you need lime. But lime might be bringing in calcium or if, depending on the type of lime, it might be calcium and magnesium. And either calcium or magnesium might increase the pH, but we don't know if the soil is acidic. We don't know if we need calcium. We don't know if we need magnesium. We might have too much magnesium, um, which can be a problem in some of the really compacted clay soils. So number one, you really do need to test. And I would test for both the, the NPK, the macronutrients, and also the trace minerals or the micronutrients. So you can get a really good sense of what have you got to start with. And if you have a very significant imbalance or soil fertility issue, 
I would look at trying to bring that in um, as you can afford it and address, you know, those the, the most severe soil nutrient imbalances or deficiencies first. And if you bring those in in uh, organic form, um, bound with organic matter in the form of manure or in the form of rock powders and things like that, that's going to more slowly release in your pasture and potentially build a long-term fertility plan for you. Um, but you may or may not be able to phase out the use of fertilizer, depending on the overall um, mass balance of nutrients coming into your farm and leaving your farm. So if you're shipping a lot of hay or meat or milk off your farm and you're not bringing in the nutrients um, to the farm to replace what you're exporting, you may end up long term needing to bring in at least a little bit of fertilizer in some form or another. And that may just be, you know, up here we get a lot of high rainfall events and so some of the fertility will actually walk wash out of our soils in addition to leaving the farm in hay and meat and milk. So we might need to just say bring in a little bit of boron every now and then to be able to encourage good legume growth in our pastures and then those legumes will provide the nitrogen that we need along with the nitrogen from the manure. Um, Another example is potassium. You might be able to just bring in a little bit of past potassium every now and then so that you can maintain that legume content. And then some of your nutrients will come, you know, in small amounts from off-farm fertility in some cases. And then it'll also be coming from good nutrient cycling uh, of the manure on the farm, nitrogen fixing from your legumes. Um, so there's lots of questions coming in about um, plants that people's animals don't want to eat, <laughs> um, uh, including Canada thistle, which is particularly spiky and hard to chew. Um, so in some cases, it's a good thing that your animals are choosing not to eat some of the weeds out there. Some of them are um, poisonous, um, some, you know, acutely so, um, and some just if they eat too much of it over a long period of time. So you're going to want to make sure you identify what your weed species are and understand, you know, whether there is a potential toxicity issue. So that's, you know, step number one. Step number two is um, figure out if the weed is spreading or if it's actually getting better over time. By, it, you know, if it's a weed that they won't eat, sometimes you can get rid of it just by doing a really, really good job of managing the desirable grasses and legumes around those weeds so that those grasses and legumes have a competitive advantage and then doing a little bit of strategic clipping and trampling of those plants that they won't actually graze and you'll be able to get those weeds to go away over time. And then every now and then you will run into some weed species that are just super challenging to get rid of. Um, you know, horse nettle or Canada thistle are certainly some of the ones um, that can really take a concentrated effort to get rid of. But in that process, make sure you don't get overly focused on the problem weed. You want to spend most of your observation time looking at whether the grasses and legumes that you do want in your pasture are getting more vigorous and improving over time. You're also monitoring for weeds. Um, but if we get too focused on the weeds, sometimes we do too mm -hmm. much trampling and mowing and start to damage our good grasses also. Um, it's almost, uh, it's eight minutes yeah. past. Um, Larissa, should we uh, wrap up here? You want me to take one more? How about one more and then, yeah, then I'll wrap up. Okay. Um, <laughs> your pick. <laughs> um, let's see. There are oh, so many about soils coming in. Um, yeah, so um, somebody's recommended gypsum. Um, so, you know, gypsum is another fertility input that um, has sulfur and calcium in it. So, you know, it's just an example that lime isn't your only way to get calcium on the farm. There's many, many different types of soil fertility inputs that you can bring in. Uh, some of it is regional, depending on local prices and things like that. Um, and there's some questions about converting um, cornfields or annual crop areas to pasture. And in that case, you're definitely going to want to do that soil test right off to begin with. Um, and um, the recommendation for um, what, what do I put down as a seed mix? Um, so that is very regionally specific. 
And, uh, you know, if, if you're in the northern part of the U.S. or in Canada, that's going to be a mixture of legumes and cool season grasses. If you're further south, it might include some warm season grasses. Um, but assuming that, that you're going with, um, with annuals, you're really going to want to do your research and find out what are the grass species and what are the legume species that thrive and get better over time in well-managed pastures in your area. So, for example, if you're um, pretty far north in the or in the Maritimes, you're going to want to plant, you know, meadow fescue and um, timothy and orchard grass. As you go further south and it's hotter and drier during the summer, you may have to look at some of the improved non-toxic varieties of tall fescue. But you wouldn't want to plant that tall fescue up here in the north because it's going to have lower palatability and the animals aren't going to want to eat it as much as the other cool season grasses that we can grow up here because we have more um, cooler temperatures in the summer and more rainfall. Legumes are similar. There are legumes that are better adapted to drier conditions with a taproot like um, alfalfa or red clover. And then there are legumes that are not so well adapted to hotter, drier soils, but are going to do very well in the cooler, wetter areas like our um, the uh, white clover, for example, is a great grazing uh, legume, but it's not going to do so well in hotter, drier conditions. So it really pays to do your research and um, don't just go with what the local seed salesperson says. Um, really do your research on it. A lot of times the seed salesperson's um, data is coming from a somewhat different climate. And so definitely check out what they've got, but then go do your homework. And we're definitely over time now. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to leave no. it there. Awesome. Well, great advice, Sarah. Thank you. And I'm I'm kind of sad that our, our series is coming to a close. It's been wonderful to have you. Um, but just a few uh, housekeeping items, a friendly reminder that there is a very brief survey. If you stick around, just please um, give us your feedback. I'll also include it in my follow-up email, a link to the survey, a link to the recording, um, so that uh, you have all that for your um for your purposes. Uh, a quick plug for our upcoming webinars. So next week we'll have Lee Reinhardt from NCAT ATRA with us to present best practices for managing rotational grazing of pigs and poultry. So that's a, another piece of the grazing puzzle. Um, and then uh, also, I know that there's a lot of interest in silvopasture. So later in the month, March 25th, we'll have Steve Gabriel joining us for a webinar called Trees for Livestock, Food, and Medicine. Um, so I'll uh, include links to those webinars in, in my email as well. So um, so I'd like to just extend a really special thank you to you, Sarah. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you with us over the last month or so. Um, I've certainly learned a lot and I'm really glad that we were able to offer this, this series together. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone out there in the audience for your interest and attention and sticking around tonight, today. Um, so please tune back in next week. Uh, in the meantime, have a wonderful afternoon and goodbye for now. Thanks, everyone.